Hi everyone, sorry, I'm just getting ready right here. What's going on? It's Tuesday, that means it's the Rom Kids Show. Nice to see you all here. My name is Kieran. Uh, I run the kids camps at the Royal Ontario Museum, and for the next 30 minutes, we're gonna entertain you. We're gonna tell some stories about science, art, and history. Uh, today, we're learning all about uh, insects, which I'm really, really excited about. Uh, we have our guest entomologist on, Antonia Guadotti, which we'll double check that last name when we get when we get her on the show live in just a second. It's her second time on the show, so I'm really excited to do that. We're gonna talk about midges, because that's on my mind a lot. Like, there's a million midges everywhere. We're gonna talk about spring insects. We're gonna talk about tick safety, how you can go outside safely, uh, and all of uh, these lovely little critters that come out when spring starts to bloom. So this is it, this is the ROM Kids Show, this is our distance learning initiative. Hello, hello, hello to everyone at home, in your kitchens, in your living rooms, uh, tuning in with us today. We're gonna make blooming insects, so I'm really excited to, uh, to do that with you. Hello to everyone in your classrooms, uh, whether it's virtual or not, good to have you with us today. Um, and then hello to everyone watching on YouTube at a later date. Always nice to hang out with you. Um, we covered a lot of different things. What well, last week we spoke about masks, which was really cool. A couple weeks ago we did uh, what? We've done density experiments on the show. We did an episode with four different explosions, all with some of our favorite uh, guests and experts from the Royal Ontario Museum. Now, very quickly, just in the monologue, about a month ago, uh, we had Veronica DeCecco on the show. She's a geologist at the museum. And we we're talking about crystals and gems and rocks and minerals. And we made sugar crystals, okay? Now, uh, live on the show, I'm going to debut my sugar crystal. Um, oh, maybe I should do this at the table so you can see the crystals. Let's do that. So let's do the theme song first, and then we're going to move on over. Hello. Uh, we got some fans here. Hello from kindergarten with Miss Younger and Miss Gomez. Nice to see you. Welcome, welcome. Oh, we got some more people here. Oh, Miss White's class. Big fan of that class. What's going on, friends? Very excited. Ankita, nice to see you. Lots and lots and lots of fun people with us today. Theme song, then gems, then insects. Let's go. Welcome to the Rom Kids Show with me. We'll do some crafts and tell some stories. Let's talk about science art and history. Welcome to the Wrong Kid Show, starring you and me. There we go. That's the theme song portion of the event. A little bit of an adventure there in the middle, but we did it. Okay, I know we're all dying to see how my sugar crystal went. Now, up on the ROM website, you can find all of our like activities and things that we've done. And so our good friend, assistant camp director, Alex Schneckenberger, did the sugar experiment, sugar crystal, a while ago, and she did an amazing job with it. Her crystals were giant. You can also find up on the ROM website, too, a way to make salt crystals. Now, mine didn't turn out so hot, but we're going to debut them right here. So you have to be careful when you get it out because the top is all, like, sugar crystal-y. Look at that. That's my sugar crystal right there. So I used um, green food coloring and then very interestingly, almond flavor. Because you can put flavor in. You can put vanilla in, which would make it taste really good. I put almond flavor in. Let's see how it tastes. Almondy. It tastes almondy, but it doesn't taste that bad. So you can make sugar crystals too. It requires a lot of sugar, like too much sugar for me, it makes me sick. Um, but probably the perfect amount of sugar for kids. So there you go, it's all up on the ROM website. Or just Google ROM Kids Show and everything is there. I'm gonna enjoy this later. That's my sugar crystal, y'all. That was fun. It did turn out great, thank you. Um, okay, so today on the show, we are making blooming insects. So what do you need to make your blooming insect? You need paper. All right, I have cardstock, but regular sort of printer paper works too. You need uh, coloring materials. I'm using Sharpies because if I use washable markers, you'll find out later that the marker color will sort of bleed out because we're putting it in water. So I, I'm using Sharpies, but you know, follow your heart, follow your dreams. I'm gonna use a pencil to draw my insect originally. I need scissors to cut my insect out. And then you need a tray with water in it that we're gonna put 
our insects in afterwards, and then we're going to see how their wings come to life along with uh, this flower that I've made as well, okay? So you can do that with us on the show um, while we're doing this. Um, but right now, it is my privilege, it is my honor, it is with great excitement that we welcome back to the show entomologist Antonia. Now, is the last name, how do I say it? Guidati. Guidati, okay, great last name, great. love it. Um, we're talking about insects, so if you have questions about insects, you have an expert right here with Antonia, great friend of the show. Now, right when right, right before we started the show, we were talking about the bee that I made, um, and there's something wrong with my bee, right? How many wings does a bee actually have? Four. Four, and you can see on mine that there's only two. So how, how are there four wings? How does that work? Well, there's two pairs of wings. There's a larger pair on the top side, and then there's um, a smaller, thinner pair, and usually a little bit tucked underneath of the pair of wings. You can so see- That's a bumblebee that you're looking at there. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you, I don't know if you, you probably can't tell in that photo, but there are two pairs of wings. Flies, on the other hand, have only one pair of wings and a really small, reduced, tiny, they're not really wings, but we call them hull tears, um, pair. Um, so they have one pair of wings. Um, the name of flies is diptera, which means two wings. Um, and all the other insects, for the most part, like beetles and bugs and um, stone flies and mayflies they all have two pairs of wings so most insects have two pairs learning that here first uh great way to go and check this out is just to, like google for different like uh bee images and things like that and again you'll see like that top wing and then you'll see that like bottom wing and so we're going to try and fix that when we make our uh insects today now you can do any insect i'm going to do a bee because then i can just trace this um, but be really excited about it and I'm going to tell you some tips while we do this. But one thing I want to do is I want to send a shout out to one of our young viewers, our young four year old friend Remy, who, ha who came up with this idea uh, and shared it with us on the show. So if you have cool ideas for projects and activities and experiments, let us know because maybe we can do it on the show and bring on a really cool guest as well to talk about that theme. All right. So thank you, Remy. Great job, bud. I'm so excited to see what you make. All right. Um, Kieran, you made me want to be. There we go. I like that. I like that. Uh, always here for Spice Girls reference as well. So with that said, the first thing I want to talk about with you, Antonia, is something that a lot of people, I think, in Toronto are experiencing right now, which are massive swarms of midges. First, what is a midge? So a midge belongs with the, the flies. It's a fly. Uh, the ones that we're seeing are non-biting midges. And the reason that we're seeing so many of them is because if you live close to the water, the midge larvae, they actually live underneath in the water. And different species emerge at different times. And this species right now, it's, it's their time to emerge and they come out of the water and they mate. Basically, that's all they're going to do is uh, mate and they're looking that's what the big swarms are. They're looking for a mate and, um, and then they're going to die. Um, Why are there so many? The well, we live on a very big lake. <laughs> lake Ontario is pretty big. Oh. Yeah, that's part of it. Um, and they are a big part of the uh, ecosystem. Um, in the water, they're great food for fish, for other insects. And when they come out as adults, they're food for birds. Hmm. So um, it's actually kind of great that they are that they all come out at the same time for the birds. Anyway, they have a big feast. Um, and uh, they're really important in a lot of freshwater systems. So they're like um, a key part of like our ecosystem and in the food chain. Huh. Yes, very important. Yeah. Well, 
uh, there's certainly a lot where we live. Uh, we live in like an apartment down sort of by the water and midges are everywhere. And I had this really cool, I saw this bird just like, you just hop onto our balcony and just like laying it out, eating up all the little midges. So interestingly, uh, now I wanna show this picture that you shared with me of all of these midges on this leg. What's going on here? That's like, to me, that's a little scary. <laughs> so it's, they're just looking for a place to land and because there's so many of them, they land on everything. And um, in that, that particular day, there were thousands and thousands of these midges. And I just thought that was a cool, uh, <laughs> that was a cool picture to take. Um, yeah, that was, a, that was a different species. Those were actually bigger than the ones that we have emerging right now. Um, and yeah, at different times of the year, there'll be different species that emerge. That one was in June. So it was a bit later in the season. Now we got a really interesting picture here from now retired uh, invertebrate paleontologist, Dave Rudkin. Here is a spider eating a midge. It's kind of hard to see, but that's what's going on. I guess my question for you is like a midge to me is really, really small, but to a spider, is that like a good sized meal? How many, like, how many of them do they need to eat? Well, I don't know how often zebra spiders eat, probably that often, um, because they're small. I don't know if you've ever come across a zebra spider, but they're tiny little jumping spiders and they're really cute. And you can find them in yards, in parks, on walls, in the playground, probably at your school, on the outside of the school. And they're, they're in a lot of different places. And the, the, the zebra spiders will try and catch whatever they can and they jump to catch them. They're pretty quick. Hmm. Okay, I just wanna do a quick sort of update on my art right here. So you can see I made my two wings. Now what's really important with uh, your, your folding part, the wings that you're gonna fold, is you have to make sure that they don't go uh, more, be like beyond the other side of your insect, okay? If it goes too far, like if this wing was bigger and went over top of the other wing, then this wing won't be able to fold, okay? So make sure your wings are only as long as your body is wide, okay? That's really, really important. Now one of our friends has a question and it's about bees and I think it's because we're making a bee. Remy wants to know, why do bees sting? So, um, Bees have, uh, all bees have a stinger. It's um, the female, sorry, I should say, the female bees have stingers. And if you're annoying them or if you're doing something to irritate them, um, they are going to sting you. But generally they don't want to do that and they will fly away and, and try and get away, from, uh, get away from you instead. Interesting. So, so yeah. just don't bother bees and the bees won't bother you. On that topic, we have another question from our group chat and it's from Miss White's class. Hello again, we love seeing you folks here. Um, why do red fire ants bite? Ooh, the red fire ants. Yeah, um, the European fire ants, they actually bite and sting. So they're even nastier. What? Um, and that's, I don't know why they do. That's a good question. They just happen to get on you and because you move around and stuff, they will use their stinger because you're bothering them. Interesting. So, so this is another example of like, don't bother animals and animals won't yeah. bother you. Um, the fire ants live near water too. Um, so if you're on a beach or something like that, especially around Toronto, an area, you might come across them. Okay. There you go. All this is reminding me of the Bloodsuckers exhibit. Incredible exhibit that was at the ROM two years ago. That was full of animals that sucked your blood. Um, okay, I have a question. It's sort of on relation to that ze zebra spider that we saw earlier, but I guess it, it happens with all different sorts of spiders. I wonder, I see so many insects during the summer, but then during the winter, I don't see as many as we move up locations right here. Really excited about this. Um, I see uh, insects all over the time during the summer. Like right now, you're probably seeing a bunch. Um, but what, where do insects go 
during the winter? Where do spiders go during the winter? That's a really good question. And it depends. So in the winter, um, some uh, spiders will overwinter as eggs. So, you know, the big orb weavers that you see, uh, they will make a big egg sac and that egg sac is what survives the winter. The adults all die. With zebra spiders and some of the other jumping spiders, they will overwinter as small spiders and they will find a nice warm sheltered place to hide. And then they will come out in the spring and they will mate and they will lay eggs. But like all other, um, I wanna say arthropods because spiders are not insects, of course, um, it depends on the species. Some of them over, have different strategies for overwintering. Hmm, that's really interesting. We have another question from our chat. Oh, does the craft have to be a flying insect? No, and Remy, if you want to make a monster truck, go for it. I encourage you to find a way to make it work. Um, okay, Dia asks, and she's four years old, um, why do flies have wings? Oh, that's interesting. I guess it's the fly, right? They've evolved to fly. And so just yep, get away from prey and to find food. Oh, I really like that. We also have another question. Um, what do insects eat? This is a big question. What do insects eat? Wow, that is a big question. So depends on the insect again. There's insects that will um, feed on nectar like butterflies. There are insects that will feed on plants, like um, aphids and things like that. They will suck the juices out of plants or like caterpillars. They will actually eat the plant. Um, there are insects that will feed on other insects or other animals. So it, it depends on the insects, but there's lots of strategies for feeding. And then there's a few that are blood suckers like mosquitoes, mm -hmm. right? So uh it's everything yeah, <laughs> yeah lots of different things so just in the same way that we uh, uh you know we as people we eat lots of different types of food insects eat a lot of different types of food too so anything that you can think of it's probably happened oh we have a great question from tashni welcome uh why do bees have antennae or antennae antennas so all insects have antennae. That's one of the characteristics of insects. When, um, when you try and define or describe what an insect is, usually we talk about the exoskeleton, we talk about antennae, we talk about three body parts and six legs. Am I missing anything here on? That sounds about right. The six <laughs> legs ones I know for sure. <laughs> But antennae are, are very important, and spiders don't have antennae. Oh, and that's another way that you know a spider is not an insect and is arachnid. We're going to talk a little bit more about um, arachnids in a bit. Um, I do have a question for butterflies, okay? So we, sure. we know that like monarchs, they travel great distances um, down to Mexico and then back up to Canada during the summer. But where do, do all butterflies travel really far away in the winter or do some stay here? So um, that's a good question. And we, we separate them into migrants. So the ones that want to get away from the cold and go south where it's nice and warm, like the monarchs or the red admirals or the painted ladies, they will migrate south and they will stay in places where it's warm for them. Uh, a lot of the resident butterflies, the ones that stay here all year round, they will find different ways. They have different strategies for surviving the winter. Some of them live as eggs, some of them as caterpillars, some of them as chrysalids, and some as adults. I like so in the spring, the first ones you see are the ones that overwinter as adults. Uh -huh. And some of those are the, the morning cloaks, the tortoise shells, the commas, the question mark. All of those overwinter as adult butterflies and they do that by hiding in leaf litter so um, one of the things that people suggest if you have a yard and you have a garden and there's leaves around leave the leaves in the fall because you might have butterflies or moths overwintering there 
That's awesome. Okay, a couple things I want to take 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 apart take away from that. So we just learned two big things about butterflies. Migrant butterflies travel uh, during the winter to go to another place, and resident butterflies stay here and they overwinter here. And then the other thing is when you're thinking about your yard, when you're thinking about your your outside space. Sometimes it feels nice to like move away all of like the plants and like the the leaves that have fallen from the trees, but maybe consider leaving some of them there because butterflies might live in them. Oh, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. Okay. And bees might be in there too. Cause some of bees overwinter as adults too. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Okay. Move, continuing to move through our different types of insects here. Oh, and I do have a question. Um, Okay, one of our questions is about bees, and we were talking about this before. There are lots of different types of bees, right? How do you tell the difference between mm -hmm. different types of bees? Oh, wow, that's a taxonomy question. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. That's what I've been doing, actually, for the last few weeks, is trying to figure out what the different bees are. And it's not always easy, because bees are really hairy. And you have to look at different characters on the bodies of the bees to figure out what they are. And it, I've been using a microscope to do that. So um, that helps me. And I've been using some books that also have um, what we call keys in them to help me figure out what the different species are. For, um, for you to try and figure it out, what you could do is... Um, take a picture of the bee and you could use iNaturalist if you post it there and it might help you with the identification. There might be somebody there that can help you with the identification of the bee. Nice. Uh, that's one way of doing it. Yep. So lots of different picks and we're, we, we are definitely going to close on a push for everyone to go outside safely and take a look at all of our cool animal friends that are out there. Okay. Mm -hmm. We have another question from the chat and I think this one's really interesting because I think it has a, a, a cool answer. What do, so we know that caterpillars turn into butterflies. We know that caterpillars eat like lots of leaves and things like that. But what, once they turn into a butterfly, what does a butterfly eat? What does a butterfly eat? Yeah. Oh, well they go after the nectar that flowers have. So they kind of, they, I want to say they steal the nectar, but that's their food. So they they go from flower to flower, and then they feed on the nectar because uh, it's nice and sweet and it's a liquid. So they that's that's what butterflies eat. That's so interesting that at different parts of your life you would eat different types of food. Um, okay, mm -hmm. we have another question from Honey right here. Um, what do spiders eat? We we have a lot of food related questions on this show often. Spiders eat. What do, what do, what do they do? Well, um, we saw that the zebra spider actually um, got a midge um, and spiders, it depends on how big they are and how they get their food. So some of them are hunters, like the, the jumping spiders will go around looking for food and they will find um, other, in, they will find insects to eat. And then you have the ones that make the big, beautiful webs and those spiders um, we'll also eat insects, but they'll eat insects that fly into their web. So whatever they can catch um, is actually what they'll eat. I like that. And friends, and with the last time Antonio was on, we did a whole episode primarily about spiders. So make sure to check that out on, on, on the wrong website. Now we do have another question from our group chat, but I want to show you a trick that I learned. So uh, bees wings are sort of translucent, which means you can sort of see through them. And I didn't really know a way to like illustrate that. So what I did is I'm drawing blue around the edges of the wings, around like the, the wing membrane, to try and give it the effect that is translucent and that you can see through it. So that's a good trick right there for your art. Okay, can I see that question? Oh, Miss White's class wants to know. Big question. Moths, butterflies, are they the same? Are they different? What's going on here? So they belong to the same order which is Lepidoptera, which means they have scaly wings, but they're separated by certain characteristics. So moths and butterflies, um, most 
butterflies, actually all butterflies are, they fly during the day, but uh, moths are mostly night flyers. They will, they're active at night. And they also have an abdomen that's usually quite a bit thicker mm. than the butterfly abdomen, which is a bit thinner. Uh, and this is just a general thing. Um, moths sometimes aren't quite as colorful as butterflies, although you find different colors in both groups. And the antennae is important. So with moths, the antennae are either straight, like just like that, or they're feathery. And they have a little feathery antennae. With butterflies, the antennae are straight, 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 and then they have a little knob at the end. So if you see sort of a, a thicker part on the antennae, that's a butterfly. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay, we had another question related to butterflies and their colors. They seem to come in lots of different colors. I'm gonna take this question a little bit different way here. Why do butterflies come in so many different colors? They've evolved that way. Uh, I'm not 100% sure why they have, but it just depends on the selection that happened over the hundreds of thousands of years that they've been evolving. Some of them, you'll see a lot of butterflies that have red and orange colors. That's kind of a warning to birds and to other things like, don't eat me because I don't taste very good. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always work, but it's a strategy that they try. So that's why you'll see a lot of orange and red colors in butterflies. Mm, it's a warning. I really like that. Um, okay. You told me something really interesting in the pre-interview about blister beetles and bees. What's their sort of scary connection? So this blister beetles are beautiful. They're, they're a bright metallic blue color. Uh, oh, there you go. Kieran has a picture for you. They're gorgeous if you ever see them. Do not pick those up. There's a reason they're called blister beetles. Um, they can give you a bit of a, a burning on your in your hands if you touch them. So watch them, admire them, don't play with them. But um, to your question, Kieran, the larvae of blister beetles they actually feed on the food of in beehives. So a lot of bees will nest in the ground, like bumblebees and some other, uh, other kinds of bees. And so they will dig a hole in the ground and they'll nest underneath there. The blister beetle larvae will go into that, that nest and it will feed on the food that's being provided for the bee larvae. So it eats all the bee larvae's food. And when it's eaten all the bee larvae food, it actually eats the bee larvae too. What? Yeah, I know. Um, but I think there's enough bees around uh, for for us to be, you know, very tolerant of the blister beetles, especially since they're so beautiful. They are. Okay, we had another question related to bees. And so you're just talking about bee larvae. So there's like mm -hmm. a life cycle, right? Like mm -hmm. what, what does the lar does the larvae turn into like the bees that we just see outside? So uh, in, I want to say in kindergarten, but it might be grade one, we learn about complete metamorphosis. And usually we learn about it with butterflies, how there's an egg and a caterpillar and a chrysalis and the adult. Well, bees go through complete metamorphosis too. We start with the egg and then the larvae, but we call it a pupae, not a chrysalis and then the adult bee. So that's complete metamorphosis, the four stages. Hmm. There you go. I didn't, like, I, I never really processed that, that the that bees go through a metamorphosis too. That's really interesting. And uh, flies and beetles. Okay, okay. Now we, uh, often Antonia, I'll see you outside at like Tommy Thompson Park or doing bio blitzes or things like that because you're really engaged with nature and seeing all of like the diversity of, of insects and arachnids that we can see outside. Um, mm -hmm. Right now we need to be safe when we go outside with only staying in our household bubbles and staying distant from others and wearing masks and all of those things. Um, but we also need to stay safe from a small arachnid outside too. First, what is a tick? And then we're going to talk about tick safety here, folks. So I'm glad you brought that up, Kieran, because 
Ticks, you're right, are arachnids. They're closely related to mites. So they have eight legs. And you can find them in the forest or if you're on a hike and in the meadow and grasses and, and places like that. Sometimes even um, people sometimes have yards that are very close to a ravine or, to, or back onto one of these very nice green spaces. And it could be there. Uh, ticks don't fly because we said, you know, they're arachnids. So they get around by crawling. And um, unfortunately, uh, there's a species of tick that carries a disease called Lyme disease, which can make you very sick and you don't want to get it. Uh, so if you find uh, a tick that's on you and it has been feeding, it's very important to carefully remove the tick so that you don't break off the mouth parts and that you keep the tick and get it checked out um, or that you bring it to a doctor. Because if it's, if it's been on you for more than 24 hours, it could have transmitted the disease. So the best thing to do is if you're going for a hike or a walk is to wear long pants that are tucked in. If it's an area that has lots of ticks, if in long sleeves, when you come home, um, or even after your walk or hike, have somebody check you out. So, you know, make sure that you check underneath your arms and all the different places where they might hide because they like to crawl and just do a check and remove any ticks that you might have picked up. And if you do it right away, you won't get sick. You won't, you, you, they can't transmit the disease. So it's very important to do something like that right after you go for a walk or a hike. There you go. So stay safe when you're outside uh, and do that tick check. When we go out, we go out for like one big walk every week. And when we go, we make sure that when we're done, we check our legs, check our pants, check like all around our ankles just to make sure we're not taking any tick friends home because tick friends belong in the wild and not on us as people. So I've cut out my B. I didn't actually expect to finish it, um, but I did. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fold my wings and you can see I've learned, because I learned today, that bees have four wings, top wings and bottom wings. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna fold my wing across the body, all right? Just like so. And again, you wanna make sure that it's not bigger than the body itself, all right? So that's why it is that size. And then I'm gonna fold my other wing, right top two. Okay, you can see my bee is now wrapped up in their wings. And Tony, thanks so much for being on the show. Let's do some science right here. Let's see what happens when we drop our bee in. First, let's drop in today's bee. So it's just gonna sit there for a little bit. Now those wings are like pretty tight, but you can see they're starting to open up. Now this is my bee that I made yesterday. I'm gonna throw that right on top. And you can see like the wings just sort of pop open. Here is a blooming flower that I made just before the show. And then that's also gonna take some time to slowly open. If you've done it already, they open up really fast, but on your first time that you do it, they open up a little slow. But you can see our wing right here is starting slowly to open. It might struggle to open on the other side though, because it has no room but sort of the water pulls the wings across. And of course, look at that old one from yesterday, looking beautiful. I've had so much fun um, talking to all of you. Oh, okay, we have one final question. Okay, one final question from the chat. I like this. Um, Ibrahim wants to know, do bees fly at night? No, they don't. They actually go back into their uh, hives or nests and uh, they spend the night there because it's, it's dark at night. Just like us, we like to sleep. Um, we like mm -hmm. to, to sleep at nighttime and so do our bee friends too. Okay, with that, thank you so much, Antonia, for coming back to the show. It's been fun. Lots of great questions today. We loved all the questions that came from classrooms and from homes. Thank you for joining us. This episode will be up uh, on YouTube later this week. Again, hello to all our YouTube viewers. We'll be back next week uh, with invertologist, invertebrate, 
ologist? Eh, look it up. Dr. Sebastian Convinced will be on, and we're going to talk all about deep sea animals and all the inverts, which is to say animals that don't have spines that live on our deepest oceans, okay? So we hope to see you back then. Otherwise, everyone, stay safe. We love you. Wear a mask. Bye, friends.